After John was put in prison, Jesus went to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting the net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left the nets and followed him. When Jesus had gone a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them. They left their father Zebedee in the boat with the men they had hired and followed him. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. <laughs> Our gospel text this morning it gives me as a preacher so many spaces that I wanted to go with. And so... I found myself wrestling constantly with like, what should I say about this text? And I could say this, I could say that, I could say the next thing. And then I tried to figure out how to introduce this sermon. And I wrote about five different intros to this sermon. They were all terrible. And um, so eventually I ended up deciding I'm just going to start the sermon right? with, with two questions that jumped out to me. And these two questions are what I want to focus on on the text that we've just had read to us. And what I'll then do, just so you know, is spend my night sleepless about all the other things I should have said or could have said this morning. <laughs> but I want to talk about one particular thing that struck me as I read the gospel for this morning. And, and it's a question about our spiritual formation. It's, it's a question about what's going on in this story, which has so, like, please, this week, go back and read this again and again and again. It's familiar to some of us. If you grew up in like Sunday school, you probably like remember, like I'm old enough to remember like those kind of felt boards where they would stick people on. And we loved this story of the calling of the disciples. Is that just me? Is anybody else do the felt boards? There was a whole song that went with it. With it. Anybody remember the song? I will make you fishers of, yeah. Yeah, it's in your head now for the whole week. You're welcome. And, um, but here's the two questions I have about this text when it speaks to our own spiritual formation. Questions are this, very simple questions. Number one, as I read this text, I was drawn to this question. What are the disciples doing? Which leads to a follow-up question, very simply, what is Jesus doing? And I want to just hold those two questions in our hearts this morning as we approach to the table. What are the disciples doing? What is Jesus doing? In our teaching group this week, as we met, uh, we're talking about how we were going to wrestle with this text in our own study and then in the various different uh, areas that this is being taught this morning. We were kind of drawn to the very obvious thing that's stated in the text. I wonder if you noticed it as it was read to you, just wonderfully, just a few moments of it. An obviousness that sort of is easy to miss, but I wonder if because it's so obvious, we should pay attention to it. Andrew and Simon are casting a net into the sea the text says. And then Captain Obvious Mark says, for they were fishermen, which is not a huge surprise to you. You'd figured that out by yourself. Like you didn't read Simon and his brother Andrew were casting a net into the sea, and you didn't think to yourself, I wonder if they're in internet security. <laughs> right? uh, they sound like realtors. No, they were fishermen, the text says. Well, like, duh. Like, of course they were fishermen. They're casting nets into the sea. But I think this is the genius of St. Mark here as he writes this text for us. Because he tells us they are fishermen on the basis of what they're doing. What they're doing tells us what they are. They're doing fishermen things because they are fishermen. Do they believe they are fishermen? I don't know. Do they feel like fishermen? Like is Andrew casting the net into the sea and saying to, to Peter, you know, I just don't really feel like a fisherman this morning. And Peter says, you know what, me too. Sometimes I doubt that I am a fisherman. Now, anyone who's ever fished actually probably has doubted whether or not they are a fisherman. Um, but they're fishermen because they're doing fisherman things. Mark seems to offer us something about the deep spiritual formation story that's going on here that points us to think very, very carefully about the habits and the power of our habits. That what we do will shape what we are. 
And we have a tendency when we talk about things of faith to constantly, and we've talked about this before at Westside, but to constantly distance our behavior from our being. We like to think about faith in the context of it being ideas, of it being rational thinking, of it being maybe emotions if we're really sort of trying to be advanced. But we get very uncomfortable, particularly if we live and worship in the modern West, we tend towards getting uncomfortable with the role of practices in our faith, with the role of things that we do that might shape us. We like faith to be in our head. We like faith to be in our hearts get a little resistance when we talk about faith in our bodies. As a result, perhaps you've heard somebody say this, perhaps you've said this at some point, that your Christian journey, when you're taking stock of where you are, maybe you've said, am I a Christian? Do I believe properly to be a Christian? Do I think the right things to be a Christian? Do I have the right faith to be a Christian? Do I feel like a Jesus follower? Have you ever encountered someone or has it perhaps been yourself where for whatever reason there's some moment in your life where you're just not sure if your beliefs, your faith, or your feelings are really holding together what you want to be true? I know in my journey, there's been many points where I've wondered, am I really a follower of Jesus? Because if Jesus knows what's going on in my mind, which he does, maybe I'm not quite cutting it. But it's really hard to imagine Peter throwing nets out into the sea going, but the thing is, I just don't believe I'm a fisherman. <laughs> it's hard to imagine Andrew hauling fish back in over the side of the bo- boats and be like, you know, some days I just don't really know if I'm actually a fisherman. They don't think like that. They don't say things like that because their practices are holding and proving what is true of them. And this is the power of a practice-driven faith. A faith that wants to take part of all of your body, not just how you think, not just how you feel, but how you behave and what you do. This is why churches baptize people, by the way. Because when, and this is why we do it publicly often, not secretly. There are times around the world where people need to get baptized secretly. Canada is not one of those places. And one of the reasons that baptism is public is because you know something happened to you and we all know that something happened to you. We were all there and they live streamed it. We saw you get in dry. We saw you come out wet. And, and like nobody wakes up one day and thinks, was I baptized or was I not baptized? No, you got wet. We were all there. We saw it happen. The practice of baptism speaks to the absolute certainty of the fact that you have made that commitment to follow Jesus, that you have stepped into his way. And so often because we don't think and take practices seriously, we're left with just things in our head. And we start wondering, what does that mean for me? Was I really baptized? Did I actually take Eucharist? And I think this story pushes us just subtly and gently. It's going to become really important as you read your way through Mark's gospel. It shows us that our behaviors shape and form us. At some level, you will become what you repeatedly do. And Jesus comes to these people who are fishermen because they're throwing nets into the sea, and he calls them to fish for people. Uh, this is, uh, the, the way I've sort of translated this here is to try and hold the kind of slightly awkwardness of the Greek because the sentence doesn't entirely make a lot of sense. Jesus is painting a picture you've never seen before. It's just that, again, singing the song in Sunday school makes us feel familiar with this. But the text kind of reads like this, follow me and I will make you become fishers of people. This metaphor has been slightly abused in the church over the years, and we've kind of taken it to often do things that I don't think the text means. Jesus meets these fishermen, so he uses language that makes sense to them as fishermen. It would be very, very, very very strange if Jesus turns up on the side of the shore and is like, follow me, and I will make you farmers of people. And we would be like, come on, Jesus, like it was right there. (laughs) They're fishing What about fishers of people? But Jesus is dropping into something they are familiar with to explain something they are not familiar with. But unfortunately, I think we've often been deeply unfamiliar with the image that Jesus is taking as well. And as modern Westerners, we've often come to this text and all we've been able to think about when we've approached it is that this must speak to quantity because it must be the only thing that matters when it comes to fishing. And our kind of Western, metrically obsessed, capitalistic sort of way of thinking says that what Jesus must be talking about here is quantity and numbers. So whenever we've 
tended to talk about becoming fishers of people in, in, in churches along our sort of tradition. It has adjusted how we think that Jesus is calling the disciples to just scoop and gather people up as if they were something to be consumed in order to gather. This is common in our way of thinking in the Western world. More is always better. It doesn't really matter how you get there, just gather more, which has led to us being constantly convinced that a higher attended church is a better church. But Mark calls us to a slightly different practice here. He calls us to think slightly different about what's going on in this text because he's pointed out what these people are doing is what is forming them into fishermen. So when Jesus comes along and says, I will make you fishers of people, resist that tendency to think about what Jesus is saying about people and think about what is he saying about them. He's calling them to be something. He's calling them to new and different habits with different purposes, which will change their lives. There's a little bit of cause and effect going on there. Your practices, Peter and Andrew, your practices made you fishermen. You're casting nets, you're a fisherman. Why don't you come and learn new practices? New practices that will change and shape you in different ways. You care about fish right now, come and care about more. You care about well-being right now, your well-being, your survival, your hunger. What if you came and cared about the well-being of others? But at some level, I think the reason Jesus uses this image to help these disciples is Jesus seems to be saying, how you learn to be fishermen will also be how you learn to fish for people. It's in the doing of the things. It's in the committing to the things. It's in the practicing of the things. Notice Jesus calls these disciples, and for three years they follow him. He teaches them how to pray. He teaches them how to teach. He teaches them how to even try and do miracles. He teaches them the way of him. And in the practicing of these things, they become more like him. It's stunning to me that Jesus calls them to follow him in a way that they already know. Simon, Simon Peter, Andrew, you know how you became fishermen. You know how it happened. Didn't happen by accident. You can wake up one morning like, woo, I'm a fisherman. Doesn't work like that. You know, didn't just go on Amazon and buy all the fisherman gear and become a fisherman. You know that's not how it works, right? This is a great British adage, all the gear, no idea. <laughs> it's not just, it doesn't just happen to you. You practiced and you developed and you toned those skills and you became a fisherman. What if you came to me and took on practices and skills and honed the way to care about something bigger? And this obsession with reading the metaphor of Jesus as a metaphor about numbers and a metaphor about people rather than about us, I think has led us so often as followers of Jesus to prioritize creativity and innovation. And therefore, let me just say this, here's something I notice. Churches in our context that have prioritized creativity and innovation have struggled to generate deep spiritual formation amongst their people. Because we're always looking for the new thing because we're just waiting for it to just happen for us. And Jesus comes to these disciples and he says to them, you know how you became fishermen. Come follow me, I'll show you, I'll make you, I'll help you become something else. You know this is true, right? You know this is true in every other area of your life. Stability and depth are created by consistency and practice. Nothing that you're good at happened by accident. We love this notion of God-given talent, but nothing that you're good at happened by accident. This is true in every category of your life. If you're a parent, like random parenting doesn't make you a good parent. I remember in my early 20s sitting with a group of older gentlemen whose sons were all my friends and they were all amazing guys. And I said to them like, how did you, how did you raise sons like this? And they gave me the most boring, piece of advice that a 23 year old can ever hear. They were like, we were just really consistent and we tried to always turn up. <laughs> like I wanted like, here's the one key. And if you just do this one thing, it'll all be simple for you. Cause that's what we want in the modern world. Just give me the thing. Just make me a fisher of people, Jesus. And Jesus says, no, no, no. You got to come learn how to do this with me. Nothing in your life happened by accident 
that you've learned. Like, you know, Emily is, is leading worship for us this morning. She didn't just wake up one morning and be like, I'm gonna play guitar. And then the next morning, join the band. It didn't happen that way. Whenever anyone stands up here and leads us in, in, in the time of worship, there is hours and hours and hours of work has gone into this, of learning how to do things. And there was dark moments where G to C on the guitar was painfully difficult. And then one day somebody said, there's another whole new chord under that D, G, C, D. Now you're a worship leader. <laughs> I'm joking, sorry, it was a cheap shot. <laughs> And then eventually you get good at that. And then you start to be able to put that into sequences and then you join a band and then you discover that other people are doing their things. None of this happens by accident. If you see a good athlete, if you see a clever person, if you see somebody who's good at something, they've practiced, they've put the work in. And this is why we struggle if our way to do church is like, let's always just try something new. Let's always try something different because we're constantly circulating and trying to keep up with the new thing, not learning the practices. And this is why churches across the world and throughout history have often had repeatable, dependable, solid practices. Practices of prayer, practices of scripture reading, practices of worship, practices of Eucharist. Because what we've always confessed is that they will form us if we trust them. The music teacher says, Just keep making that G chord and switch into that C chord, and one day it'll happen automatically. Your coach that's teaching you how to, how to shoot goals in a, in a hockey rink, look at me trying to be counter... British, I think that's how it works. I'm still trying to learn this sport that you guys have. There's a lot of practice going on there, but I'm pretty sure coaches one day said, don't worry, keep practicing, it will come to you. These practices will form us if we trust them. If you keep gathering with God's people, praying with God's people, praying on your own, reading scripture, learning scripture, gathering around the table, it will form you if you trust it. But that question then, these disciples are engaged in practices, Practices that shaped and defined them. That was our first question. What are they doing? Which leads to the second question. What was Jesus doing? So we know what the disciples were doing. They were doing what they'd always learned to do and they were doing it and they became recognizable as fishermen because they were doing that. But what was Jesus doing in this story? Here's what I love. I say this very reverently. Jesus appears to be doing nothing. He just turns up on the side of the shore. He's like, hey, follow me, right? And they do, <laughs> they follow him. And Mark gives us precisely no data as to why. Have you noticed this? Follow me and I will make you become fishers of people, which we've already established isn't entirely clear, right? That takes a little bit of thinking about. And the text says, and immediately, not like after some small discussion, after they read the manual, after they had some conversations, Jesus laid out a development plan for them. Nope, immediately they left their nets and followed him. Jesus was just there and they followed him. And whenever we talk about this text, and maybe this is a moment of repentance for me because as a biblical scholar, uh, you're always taught to try and make sense of a text. Like, why would this happen? How would this happen? And there's this huge sense when it comes to this scene in scripture that the Bible scholars want to rationalize the following of Jesus by the disciples. I wanna try and help it make sense to you. Maybe it's because of his teaching. He was an amazing teacher. And we love to have Jesus the teacher and let's listen to his wise teaching. Maybe it's because of his miracles. I mean, if somebody could do the miracles that Jesus did, like I would want to hang around and see what happened if you hung around following him. Perhaps it was his symbolic actions or his prophetic voice. But here's the problem. This Bible text that, that we read this morning is verse 14 of chapter one of Mark's gospel. Not a lot has happened. In fact, here's what has happened to Jesus so far. He was baptized. And the other thing that's happened is he went into the desert and was tempted by the devil. That's it. So Jesus is a stranger who turns up on the shore and says to these two young men who've spent a lot of time practicing to become fishermen, follow me, let's go do something else. And they follow him. And Mark doesn't explain why. The pastor and theologian from Germany, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he says this about this, and I love this. He said, the text is not interested in psychological explanations for the faithful decisions of a person. Why not? Because there is only one good reason for the proximity of call and deed. Jesus Christ himself. It is he who calls. 
See, the disciples are just like all of us. Like most people who turn to Jesus don't actually know what's going on. Jesus just encounters them and they know that things have changed. Why do they know things have changed? How do they know things have changed? And here's the Bible's answer to that. Because it's Jesus. It's not because of his great teaching, although it was great. It's not because of his great miracles, although they too were great. But none of this has happened yet. They didn't, they were like Peter and, and, and Andrew are not in the boat going, you know what, not only am I not sure I'm a fisherman, what I'd really like is a new religion. Right? What I'd really like is a new way of being. No, they're not doing any of that. But somehow when Jesus turns up in their space, everything changes for them. The Belgian theologian Edward Schillebeck said that all of us, like Peter, like Andrew, are seeking mystery. We're seeking for something beyond us. We want to know what it's like to be somewhere other than just this world that we've got. And these disciples, these young Jewish disciples, realize somehow, I don't know how, that they are standing before their God made flesh and visible in them, in this human body. Shilabek says, all treasures of wisdom and knowledge are laid up in him, this very one. Like they're just doing a normal job on a normal day like any other day, throwing their nets into the sea, dragging their nets back, and then God turns up on the shore and says, follow me. Somehow he's fully present to them. Do the disciples get this? Do the disciples understand this? I'm pretty certain the answer to that is no. But somehow they realize that something's different. Like they've engaged with the practices of becoming fisher people. And they knew that if they just committed to these practices, they would become fisher people. And God himself turns up on a shore to them and says, follow me. And somehow they seem to know that if they're just close to Jesus, that'll be better than not being close to Jesus. Perhaps that's where the challenge to our spiritual formation comes in. We like to get caught up in the things. We like to get caught up in the strategies and the how-tos and the how do I make my life different. And often in that, we try to make Jesus the sort of designer element in our own lives. Like, I know how my life is going to be. I'm just going to fit Jesus well into that. And while this text this morning that we read doesn't critique fishermen. It's not an anti-fisherman statement from Mark. It's not like, oh, they had to leave fishermen because fishermen are terrible people. It's the fact that they wanted to be close to Jesus, that they had to answer this particular call. The question of this text is not, can I do my job? The question of this text is, are our lives being caught up with Jesus? Because there's something in us, it's in you and it's in me. And I think this is the point of this text that actually when you meet Jesus, when you encounter Jesus, when you see Jesus on the shore, you become aware of something. Jesus is what you need. He's all you need. Just Jesus, only Jesus. And I think if you get that, a lot of the practices of the church start to make sense to you. I think if you, if you grasp that, that core sense that what the gospel gives us it's not a logic for why we follow Jesus. It's not a rationale for why we follow Jesus. It doesn't even try to make sense of why we follow Jesus. It just says, when you meet Jesus and he calls him, he calls to you, you realize you gotta follow. And that's why we come around the table. That's why our journey to try and take Eucharist more regularly is because we wanna be in the presence of the practices that draw us towards Jesus. Regularly, following through certain habits because we confess there's more than it just seems. Imagine if you were just a passerby, like the stranger walks along the edge of the shore, calls the two men in, a, in their boat and they quit their job immediately and go off and follow him. Who was that? I don't know. What did he offer? It wasn't very clear, <laughs> but they left. It's like this boat just floating around in the sea, net hanging over the side. Peter and Andrew are gone. And the story continues. It's not a fluke. The next story you heard it read, it happens with another. And these, these two sons abandon their father. He's just left with these hired hands going, oh, well, there goes the, you know, scraping the and son sign off the side of his boat because <laughs> they've left, you know, they've left to go follow Jesus. 
Because when you're in the presence of Jesus, you know that there's something more going on and you just wanna be around that. And here's the thing, as we gather in a room like this on a Sunday morning, and one of the things that's, that's always complex about gathering in a room like this is the question of what are we actually here for? And what are we doing in these particular spaces? And I think over the years, we've often thought the reason that we're here is to help our brains. But the more and more we think about Jesus, it doesn't always shape us more like Jesus. We need practices. We need something that engages our whole body, our minds, our, our emotions, and our bodies that draw us towards Jesus. Because here's what I've noticed. Some of us, we come to church on a Sunday morning and we're like, I hope the sermon's good. Or like, I hope I like the particular song that they choose. Or I hope they pick a good psalm this week. Or maybe the scripture reading will be one that I like and it encourages me. And then we also come with needs. Like, I don't know what your week's been. Like, maybe your week's been amazing. Maybe it's been terrible. Maybe it's been meh. You know, just the same as normal. And we come hoping that the sermon or the song or the psalm or the scripture will meet us where we need it to that week. Perhaps you're discouraged, really flat, needing guidance, perhaps life or work or family or finances or church or getting on top of you. And you're like, as long as they do the right thing at church, I'll be okay. Which, by the way, is a completely unbearable burden for a pastoral team. And for a worship team. And for the person that's reading scripture. Like, I can't, I can't promise to help even one of you with that. Like, can I offer words that, that I've brought in my office and hope that they will carry? And if I was to try, I think it would probably do me harm. Which would in turn do us all harm. And sometimes pastors and churches have tried to be that answer. When all the time what you actually need is Jesus. And all that the service should do is point you towards him. Say he's over there on the shore. He's over there. Throughout church history, the reason they gathered around the table was this, this was the one place they could guarantee that the Lord was present. Sometimes a scripture reading lands on you and you're like, oh my goodness, the Holy Spirit hit me hard with that scripture verse this morning. But let's be honest, sometimes we read scripture and you're like, I don't even know if I get what that was about. <laughs> nope, that's just me. <laughs> like, and you're like, that way, I know that was supposed to bless me, but I didn't even understand it. Right? And sometimes somebody prays and halfway through the prayer, your mind wants or, or the wrong song is sung and you're like, oh, I'm out now. I don't like that song and I'm not now singing to Jesus for the rest of the day. Or, or whatever it is that happens. Did you like the sermon? Did you like the song? Did you like the psalm? Did you like the scripture? Who knows? Possibly not. But did you encounter Jesus? Did he meet you and call to you? Did he remind you that he loves you? And that's what the table promises you, is yes. I can preach bad sermons. I can preach sermons that make you believe less in Jesus than you did when you arrived. Right? We can sing terrible songs. The band can all freestyle and start hiring people that decided the night before that they were just gonna be musicians and that was enough. We could turn to absolute chaos. But as long as we land here at the table, you can go home knowing that I met Jesus today and everything else is a bonus. See, because it, what the church has always confessed that as surely as a baptized person is soaking wet, so sure is the church that even if the worship team have the worst day on record, <laughs> the Holy Spirit is with us as we gather around the table. And the Christians have confessed that from the day that they were with Jesus to this day now. The same Jesus that you meet at the table that we talked about in the Psalm as we opened the service. The very same Jesus who stood on the shore and said to Simon, follow me. That very same Jesus wants to meet us daily wants to meet us regularly. And our practice is to draw us to the table and meet him here. That's why I wanna invite you to the table today. And that's why the church should always invite you to the table because you didn't come for clever words, good strategies, or neat ideas. Our confessions the church has to be that we come here because we need Jesus. So I'm gonna invite you to the table in just a moment. Kristen's gonna lead, lead our liturgy for communion this morning. But I invite you just to breathe out an affirmation that the Jesus we believe in is the Jesus who called Peter, who called Andrew, who called you, and he loves you, and you just need to be near him. Why don't you say this confession with me? I believe and trust in God the Father Almighty. I believe and trust in Jesus Christ, his Son. I believe and trust in the Holy Spirit. I believe and trust in the three in one.